The Idris Shah Foundation presents Special Illumination, The Sufi Use of Humor by Idris Shah. First published 1977, published in this edition 2018. This audiobook is narrated by David Alt. If you want special illumination, look upon the human face. See clearly within laughter the essence of ultimate truth. Jalaluddin Rumi Special Illumination – The Sufi Use of Humor Ga talaji ikhas kahi surat in insani bebin dat ihakra ashkara andaruni kandan bebin If you want special illumination, look upon the human face. See clearly within laughter the essence of ultimate truth. This important statement by Jalaluddin Rumi one of the greatest of all Sufi masters, directly contradicts such numerous sour-faced religionists as, in all persuasions, find that humour disturbs the indoctrination which is all that they usually have to offer. It is not even too much to say that the distinction between the deteriorated Sufi cults and the real message is found in the answer to whether the supposed mystic has a sense of humour and works with humour. Although this position is, through the proliferation of bigots, hardly credible to their numerous victims throughout today's world, it was not always so. Plato, if you remember, said, Serious things cannot be understood without humorous things, nor opposites without opposites. Looking even at relatively superficial aspects of the sixty jokes which follow will certainly bear this out. The ease with which a humorless bully, wearing the appropriate expression and wielding the necessary terminology, can convince unreflective people that levity is next to blasphemy is one of the causes of this situation. This is very far from saying that such a horror can actually be right. I recently came across a justification for humorlessness in religion from a distinguished prelate who expects his audience to be so obtuse that they will believe that Christianity should be approached with misery merely because there is no surviving record of Jesus ever having laughed. This aberration, known as proof by ridiculous assumptions, was not challenged by his audience, it is true, but the proverbial child in the crowd might well have wondered whether he could not therefore do anything which Jesus was reported to have done, including cursing. Luckily, in more contemporary and therefore better documented systems, there is ample information. I have never seen anyone who smiled more than the Messenger of Allah, said Abdullah, son of Harith, one of the Prophet's companions. The Prophet was famous for his sense of humour. I do not know what religious persuasion Robert G. Ingersoll adhered to, but he said in 1884, no man with any sense of humour ever founded a religion. However did he come to this conclusion? One suspects it is for the same reason as the prelate. His method of reasoning, if this is the case, is indeed proof by ridiculous assumptions. Let us look at some of the spiritual and psychological traditions of humour and note how they work. If we do so, I think we will find that the real reason why certain humorless individuals try to prevent the investigation of humour in religion by claiming that it is not there, or is antipathetic to it, is that they themselves are insecure characters who dare not enter into the area of laughter. Spiritual studies, people are saying, are far too specialised to leave to the professionals. Where these professionals are those who have turned such studies into morbid charades, this is undoubtedly true. Traditionally, it has been noted by genuine mystics that the professionals, those who have no enlightenment but plenty of obsession, can be easily discovered because they lack a sense of humour. Humour here, be it noted, is not to be assumed in those who merely giggle a lot or those who understand only the banana skin variety. Indeed, these two forms of behaviour are the types most often found in pseudo-mystics. As a shock applier and tension releaser and an indicator of false situations, 
Humor, certainly to the Sufi and traditional usage, is one of the most effective instruments in diagnostic aids. Since I have published quite a lot on Mullah Nasruddin, it is widely assumed that I confine Sufi humor teaching to researches in this figure. We shall see that adequate joke usages can be found much more widely than the Nasruddin figure. But the recent history of the Mullah's esoteric role is in itself interesting from the humor point of view. Some Orientalists, not having heard of humour as a teaching aid, although Nasruddin is mentioned as a master of secret wisdom in an English translation of some of his tales going back over a hundred years, have naturally accused me of trying to create the mullah as a teaching figure. I had, of course, made it all up. Not very long afterwards, a traveller who had resided in Pakistan and carried on Sufi studies through Nasruddin tales published an article on this in an interreligious journal. When the original critics were taken to task by a journalist for their jumping to conclusions, their spokesman said, Of course there is no truth in it. The article must have been written and planted by Idris Shah. Now, of course, the pendulum has swung back, and there are people everywhere trying to prove that their own jokes really contain wisdom, and I receive batches of them almost every week and several books are being busily written by people who will cash in on this trend. They don't know much about the subject, but certain scholars will have to work out how to handle this fact. In so doing, they will be following almost the same path as the Nasruddin joke when he was found stealing vegetables. Wondering Now, said the gardener, why are you in this walled garden? I was blown over the wall by a high wind. And how did those carrots get uprooted? They were scuffed out in my fall. And what is there in that sack? Uh, hold on, I was just wondering that as you came along. At the moment, they are just wondering. Quite one of the most fascinating discoveries in the literary exposition of humour must be what might be called the conjuring trick effect. Everyone knows the feeling of bafflement and intense curiosity to know how a conjuring trick has been performed. What is its secret? Then it is explained to you. The pressure and tension of mystery are suddenly gone. Something has been taken away, leaving a gap. This is the chief reason why magicians tend to refuse to give away their secrets. When writing about or explaining in lectures how jokes work, what they are used for, or how they have been able to exercise startlingly effective insight impacts and are highly prized in seemingly austere spiritual circles. This effect is strongly evidenced in the reactions of critics and audiences. Reviewers write that, These are no jokes at all, or that, You are making too much of too little, or feel that, The explanations are unworthy, superficial. And yet, if one resists the temptation to explain, the jokes can be used with effects which do not produce such opposition, but tend to be appreciated and applauded. Now why is this? First of all, some of the observers are obviously hostile from the start, looking for something to criticise. But these need not detain us, as they would, as the saying goes, demand wetter water if such a thing were possible. They are suffering from what I have called the need to oppose. The sense of disappointment which comes from finding that the explanation is not as dramatic as the expectation led the observer to suppose causes this letdown and the consequent sneers. The most frequent form which the manifestation of the disappointment takes is the bluster, How can a joke be spiritual? That doesn't sound very profound to me. What is really happening is that the baffled, not to say frustrated, commentator is in the same sort of position as the boy with the fly. It will be recalled that there was once a boy who caught a fly and dismembered it. He was left with a head, a body, wings and legs, but he couldn't find the fly itself anywhere. What he had failed to observe was that when assembled and operating, the parts which he had in his hand were the fly. They operated as a fly and could not be regarded as not a fly. The fly flew, and the flying of the fly, notwithstanding the bafflement of the boy, 
was the exercise of one at least of its functions. Similarly, of course, the operation of the joke before being dissected is undeniable. It is not the fault of the fly if the boy cannot understand how and why it flies, or how and why its parts don't look like the complete fly. Hence, of course, when we are dealing with an observer working at this level of superficiality, we are under no obligation to conceal what really amounts to his stupidity. We once carried out a specific illustrative experiment to demonstrate this limitation of the scoffer. Four Philistines, generally however regarded as people of some intellectual penetration, had decried the possibility of the psychological, let alone the spiritual, action of humour, claiming that they could do just as well themselves. When challenged to do so, however, two refused to demonstrate their understanding of jokes. The other two, who sportingly accepted, were unable to provide any structure analysis at all of the stories. A perhaps uncharitable spectator remarked at this point that here was an illustration of the incapacity of people accustomed to power without responsibility. You don't have to be able to do something if you can put up a plausible enough case that it is not worth doing. But these humbugs could be taken as an example of the possibility that, as Professor Robert Ornstein once said, people who think that they have big brains more often only have big mouths. You will find that people who have been conditioned by ideology and trained to peddle dogmas often conceal this under a cloak of reasonableness or have deceived themselves so much that they have a kind of two-tier life. They may appear to be eminently reasonable, but conceal beneath this a lack of flexibility and a series of blinkered attitudes which they are practised at keeping hidden. They cause people to adopt their beliefs because of this camouflage. They are also insusceptible to deeper feelings. The way to flush them out is to test whether they can endure humour or not. This is one of the reasons why Sufis use humour. Jokes are structures, and in their Sufic usage they may fulfil many different functions. Just as we may get the humour nutrient out of a joke, we can also get several dimensions out of it on various occasions. There is no standard meaning of a joke. Different people will see different contents in it, and pointing out some of its possible usages will not, if we are used to this method, rob it of its efficacy. The same person, again, may see different sides to the same joke according to his varying states of understanding or even mood. The joke, like the non-humorous teaching story, thus presents us with a choice instrument of illustration and action. How a person reacts to a joke will also tell us, and possibly him or her, what his blocks and assumptions have been, and can help dissolve them to everyone's advantage. The Flame There is a story, perhaps apocryphal, said to be told in Japan. An American tourist is being shown around a shrine. He and his guide come to a light burning on a kind of altar. That flame, quavers the aged oriental custodian, has been burning for a thousand years. The American leans over and blows it out. Well, it's stopped now, hasn't it? I have heard this tale told in perhaps five different countries. When the tourist is British, the implication is that he scorns the whole thing. When it is a Frenchman, that he feels himself superior. When it is American, that he is insensitive. The last time I mentioned this fact in rather august company, I was taken to task for having so little sense of humour myself that I either wanted to spoil others' enjoyment of a joke by analysing or trying to wring meanings out of it where none was legitimately to be obtained. But I see jokes like other people regard, shall we say, oranges. They have both experiential and nutritional content. The fact that a fruit tastes delicious does not mean that it cannot have food value. If I smell an apple and enjoy this, it does not mean that its nutritional value will be ruined if I should eat it. This argument has, it is true, 
been combated by the suggestion, ah, but if you smell a rose you enjoy it, but if you try to eat a rose bush you will be disappointed. Luckily for those who don't agree with this assertion, this can easily be refuted by saying that, while we would probably not find anyone who would eat rose bushes, we can find quite a number of other people who share the experience of perceiving value as well as enjoyment in jokes. I myself prefer to note that the character assumed by the American in our story of the flame shows him, if we assume that he is like other Americans whom we meet, to be experimental rather than reflective, more anxious to do something than to score a point by talking alone. It is this general characteristic which makes me think that the intense interest taken in Sufic studies by Americans of all kinds, including supposedly rational, sober and well-established ones, is far more constructive than it is designed to gain something, either, that is, to gain by scoring a point, or gain by consuming something. Many people will not agree with this. In answer, I can only invoke that delightful, if somewhat ungrammatical, English phrase, I speak as I find, and you can't say fairer than that. People who are unsympathetic to spiritual matters can certainly have a sense of humour, although it is not necessarily completely effective. Sometimes their jokes are more revealing of themselves than of others, but sometimes these jokes can give us a yardstick to measure some of the adventurers whom these anti-religionists take for the real thing. The Dollar There is a story that when destiny was being planned, the archetypal representatives of various peoples and schools were offered their choice of gifts. The Japanese asked to be given the Zen Koan, so that people would always be attached to the power of perplexity. The Hindu guru asked for the mantra and the assertion that everything was derived from his philosophy. Then an American-to-be was asked for his choice. Since he was to be one of the last peoples to emerge, most of the more attractive things had been handed out. But he was not long in asking, Give me the dollar, then they'll all come to me sooner or later. This could certainly account for why the United States is a country where every cult and religion, every theory and system, has sent its representatives. And, on the other hand, it might just account for the presence in the USA of mercenary ones from overseas. <laughs>